Okay, this lecture is about encryption for securing your internet and networking. So, the reason we need to encryption is because internet is unreliable. Whenever you talk to another computer, data goes in packets and packets can be corrupted because of errors on the wire. Packets can be stolen, that means somebody uh, copies your packet and doesn't deliver them forward and your sysadmin and your ISP can actually read and modify everything that goes on the network and people have sniffers. Sniffers are programs that can read everything that is traveling on the wire, the Ethernet wire or the Wi-Fi wire and for Windows we have Wireshark and for Linux you have TCP dump to uh, collect everything and if you put your sniffer in a promiscuous mode you'll get every single packet that's going by even though it's not addressed to you and of course data on your hard disk can be copied or read even if it's turned even a PC is turned off somebody can take out your hard disk and copy it so we'll see what are the problems and what are the solutions so what happens on internet is first one is DNS poisoning what happens is when you try to contact say HTTP your bank dot com so your computer doesn't know where the bank is so it goes it calls a DNS domain name server saying hey where is this bank and then domain name no server says yeah the, this is this IP address some number one two three four five and and then your, you s your computer sends a packet to, to one two three four five but what happens if the addressing is wrong it's, if the, the name server that you're asking for the address of your bank it tells you a wrong address then you send your letter to the data to the wrong uh, computer and people can take over your domain name server, DNS servers and uh, put wrong addresses in it so that's one problem and the second problem is man in the middle attack this is a common attack where what happens is your ISP or, or your sysadmin they say they are google.com and we try to read gmail or google they, they collect all the data and then they forward it to google and google whatever google sends back they send it back to you but in between they make a copy of everything so they're the man in the middle or the woman in the middle the third one is phishing phishing is basically uh, a website looks like a google.com but instead of oh they're using a zero or some other character unicode character it looks exactly like the same url but it's actually a different url and you click on it and type in a username and password and they have it so that's phishing and malware is a, a software that's installed on your computer and and basically it collects everything that you do and later on forwards it to somebody else or or it can even forward in real time it, it can forward screenshots of your screen it can forward everything that's important in your in your hard disk and the most common ones are keyloggers basically everything that you type on the keyboard goes to another website and then they collect it and later on they can reuse whatever the password and important information you typed in the computer it's not too much data so it can go very easily in a single packet so what do you do you need to lock the data locking means it cannot be open unless you you have the right key or password and locking ensure that data does not change also also both are different so we we'll look at tampering and locking data and only make sure that only the people you intended for can open the data and, and they can also verify that you are the sender and a lot of uh, protocols so let's start with some theory see what do we need first thing we need is a cryptographic hash function cryptographic means encrypting and hash means basically takes a large uh, amount of data and, and gives you a small fingerprint for example you have, a, you have a big paragraph the red fox jumps over the blue dog you, you give it a function it gives you some number and these are called one-way functions and one way means given a string you can get a number but but looking at a number you cannot get back the string so how can we use it and we'll see that in the next slide but before that it's uh, and it's hard to find two different strings which get the same uh, output so you have the the hash you can't really get and you have one string you cannot figure out another string suppose you have a hash for say please pay x dollar 100 and you want to change it to dollar 1000 you won't find uh, you won't be able to find another hash with the same hash with another number that you can fill in. So it's called one way. So you can from the from the input you can go to output, but from the output you cannot go back to the input. 
but the, uh, okay so there are many different algorithms for doing it this is from the Wikipedia a lot of stuff on Wikipedia if you really want to look go to Google and go to Wikipedia and read all the stuff and the thing is uh, the space on this side digest space is very small the output space and the input can be really huge amount of data so obviously not every input can fit into the output but the thing is vast amount of uh, input is not really uh, ever valid you will be typing x x x a billion times and looking for hash so it basically works but what can happen is if you have a small amount of space on this side you can have uh, clashes uh, basically two different strings will start matching the same output and we'll see how, what happens and what you can do about it so the, the regular function on hashing is md5 it's 128 bit output and 128 bit is uh, so enough for a long time but what happened is uh, now that with distributed computing you can build a, a, a network of servers hook each one and then uh, store all the hashes ever possible from a dictionary and then look up hashes in, in parallel so people can crack given a hash they can actually find out a string it comes from by using a bunch of computers so 128 bit is now not sufficiently safe because people can do reverse lookup you can go from output to the input so and where is the typical use for this this is used for password hashing md5 so given a password you generate a hash and you never see the password the server will only see the hash and next time you need to log in it will ask you for a password and then it will hash the password again and compare the hash stored in the database with the password you typed in the hash of the password if they're same then you logged in so it is used for password hashing is a common use of and it's basically somebody hacks into the database and copies your password hash fields they can't really get the password from it so it's a way of protection so mysql database you regularly contain hashes but there's some uh, companies that actually store string ascii passwords which are really a bad practice it should never be done and so then came along as a sha1 secure hashing one which is 160 bit so that was used by JIT and many other software and it's, it's right now it's the standard and then now you have SHA 2 also which is 256 bit and 512 bits and what you do is they used to generate signatures and you'll see examples of it how hashing is useful so whenever you're sending a long letter at the bottom you take hash of the, on the letter and paste it at the bottom or uh, send it separately on the phone saying hey there fingerprint of my letter is one two three and then and the person who receives the letter he will compute the hash and then make sure it's one two three if it's not one two three that means something has something has been modified in the what in the letter okay so let's look at more examples so what is encryption encryption is you got some string plain it's called plain text it goes into an encryption algorithm and there's a key to it and it will generate some random characters which are unreadable it's called cipher text and then you mail the cipher text and the key is kept secret so nobody really has the key except the person who's sending it and the person who's going to receive it the, per the person who receives it with a lot of data but on the person on the way they cannot really make sense of it the cipher text and then the person receiver actually uses the, the key again and then he gets the original text back the plain text so this is called a shared secret it is some number so key is actually some number which is used to modify the data and then unmodify the data later so encryption is there in computers but even before computers uh, it's been there for a long time Caesar used to do it his messages to army using Caesar cipher and in the World War II this is the German Lawrence cipher machine to encrypt high level secret messages to all the people in the war because everyone's listening to your telegraph wires and you don't want people to know what your plans are and this, uh, these are the bottom are the rotors and rotors basically number of rotors makes it really complicated to to figure out wh what the, the the password is and the password is somewhere set out here and then it it turns the number in numbers go in and numbers come out and this is what goes on the most code on a telegraph so Alan Turing is one of the guys who actually cracked the German cipher in World War two you can read about him on Wikipedia the, the most common one is a symmetric encryption it's a one way it uses one key and use a locket and then they keep the key secret and the person who receiving it opens it and there are many algorithms using one way uh, symmetric encryption DS 
triple DS, AES, IDEA, Blowfish, Serpent. So what are various domain algorithms? DS was the common standard by US government, so it's 64 bit and it could be cracked on a supercomputer. That means given some data, you can run all possible combinations, 64 bit combinations and find out in a few hours what the input was without actually having the password. So IBM strengthened it into triple DES, which is like three copies of it. That's again 192 bit cipher. And why not double CS, DS? Because the data was too symmetrical and it's not possible to, uh, it was still possible to crack it in 64 bit time. So triple DS actually mixes all the data well. Then recently the, the new standard by the US government is called AES, which is a standard around the world and a lot of software uses it. It's a 256-bit password and then it is used by everybody and it's available and free. And there's another algorithm bef used before uh, AES was IDEA, which was patented by somebody in Switzerland. And the most common one, the free algorithm is Blowfish by Bruce Shire and Serpent and a bunch of other algorithms came along. The problem is that these algorithms are there, but nobody is really sure whether they are actually secure or not. Because it depends on the mathematics behind it. And if you find some other math that has some weakness in the algorithm, the whole scheme is uh, gone. And people won't tell you that there's a bug in or bug in the mathematics. So anyone who finds a bug doesn't tell other people. For example, DA64 bit, it seems to have some bugs in it, but nobody knows if the, if the designers knew about it or not. So designers typically will not tell you so you just have to take them on the word that they're working fine and some software actually uses multiple algorithms they feed the data triple DAS, AES and whatever combination you want to make sure that like you don't have to trust anybody at one single entity for the algorithm